I'm going to just read off of this giant sheet of notes and, and welcomes and thank yous um, and descriptions and bios. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Alyssa Smith. I'm the co-founder and director of Columbus Printed Arts Center. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. It's really nice to, even though you're invisible to us, um, share a communal space with you all. Um, I want to start with a few acknowledgements. The first um, is that we'll, we'll be recording this webinar. Um, the second is the land acknowledgement on behalf of Columbus Printed Arts Center. You know, this is um, in virtual space, our studio. Um, uh, would like to acknowledge and honor the traditional territories of the Shawnee, Miamiad, Adena, and Hopewell people in which our space is located. Um, we stand in solidarity with the indigenous people who have always had profound and enduring ties to these lands. Our organizational practice has and will continue to emphasize the questioning of the complex histories in which the medium of print is entangled as well as the ways in which its contemporary applications may function as democratic tools for undoing indigenous erasure, promoting truthful and equitable cultural narratives and providing spiritual connectivity to our past, present and future communities. Um, if you're just learning about us, we are a two, about two year old community print studio as well as an education and exhibition space on the south side of Columbus. Our studio, um, sits within a 20th century fire engine, fire engine manufacturing plant, which um, you'll get a glimpse of in a bit in, in a short video, as well as the documentation of the show. Um, and you can learn more about us on our website, which is columbusprintedarts.org, or on our Instagram, which is at Columbus Printed Arts. And I'll put those things in the chat. Um, so now I want to um, thank Suzanne and Laura for taking the time to speak about your work with us tonight. I'm gonna move my window down here so I can see your faces a little bit. Um, it's been such a pleasure to work with you both um, to witness the, these incremental shifts and new relationships unfolding in the space every two weeks. Um, and I've, I've had some personal thoughts about it. Um, I have found this kind of temporary escape um, by um, kind of electing to measure these last few pandemic months by the slow intervals of exchange that have taken place in the studio, um, not by rather than than by counts or or cases, um, a different kind of accumulation. And I have used this work as an opportunity to recenter and reground myself in new notions of time and lightness and darkness. And as I have referred to it before, a poetics of healing. Um, and I just think it's an incredible uh, affirmation of the important role that artists play within and beyond catastrophic times. So thank you for um, sharing this work with us and me in our space. And Danny, thank you for being up for this and for spending time with the show and sharing your insight here. I'm very excited to, to know you now and get to work with you. Um, so, and then I have a brief ex, uh, description of the, of the project and then I'll introduce the panelists and go from there. So Return to Sender emerged through a collaborative mail exchange between Laura uh, between Larson and Silver that began in the early months of the COVID-19 stay at home order in Ohio. Each artist would make a work in reply to one received. From this looping call and response, a collection of small works grew, a living document of the pandemic embodying the experiences of loss, sorrow, vulnerability, and rage. This exchange acts as a generative center of the exhibition. Every two weeks, the artists have taken turns reinstalling the show, adding and subtracting works produced through their correspondence and creating new ones in response to the developing relationships in the gallery. Laura Larson is an artist and writer based in Columbus, Ohio. She earned a BA in English at uh, Oberlin College, an MFA in visual art from Rutgers, the, University, the State University of New Jersey, and studied at the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. She's exhibited her work extensively at such venues as Art in General, Bronx Museum of the Arts, Columbus Museum of Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, SF Camera Work, Susan, I uh, hope I'm saying this right, Bill Metter, LA Projects, and Wexner Center for the Arts. Her book, Hidden Mother, from 2017 was shortlisted for the Aperture Paris Photo First Photo Book Prize. 
Her work is represented by Contemporary Art Matters in Columbus, Ohio. Suzanne Silver is Associate Professor of Art at the Ohio State University. Silver studied at, uh, and you'll, I'm probably mispronouncing this, Suzanne, Ecole Debo <laughs> in Paris and received an AB from Smith College and an MFA at the Ohio State University. She has exhibited her work internationally, including the Axel Rab Rabin Gallery in NYC, Nexus Contemporary Art Center, Contemporary Jewish Museum, David Yellen College, the Castle of Otranto, Proteus Gowanus Gallery in Brooklyn, Weston Art Gallery, as well as in Columbus at the Bureau for Open Culture, Angela Maleka Gallery, the Beeler Gallery at CCAD, and the Columbus Museum of Art. Her work is in the collection of the Centre Pompidou in Paris and the Jewish Museum in New York. Danny Marcus is Associate Curator at the Wexner Center for the Arts and Lecturer in the Department of History of Art at The Ohio State University, where he teaches on modern and contemporary art exhibitions and curatorial studies. So welcome everyone. Um, I've made a quick little handheld video walkthrough of the exhibition for anyone who's not been able to visit the space in person. Um, it's just meant to give a sense of how the work is dispersed throughout the space. So I'll play that now once. And then also again at the end for those who come late, it's, I think it's like two and a half minutes or something like that. And then we'll have about 45 minutes for discussion and then open space up at the end for questions. Um, so please put any questions you have in the Q&A function box. Um, if you know how to do that, you can also throw things into the chat if you, if you don't, and we'll try to scoop them up and address them and we'll do our best to get to everything. And if you have a burning, burning question, you might push the raise your hand button and see if Danny sees it. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen now. And there's no audio, uh, audio to this video. So if you don't hear anything, that's why. Right.
I'll hand it over to Danny. Thank you so much, Lisa. So, um, and thanks for the invitation, Suzanne and Laura, both to do this business of moderating, but also for the, um, the, the opportunity to spend time with the show and really get to think about your work in, in that context. Um, what I'm gonna do is um, share screen. I have um, a bunch of photographs that um, Suzanne and Laura um, both took um, to kind of to give details of things um, in the video that were passed over quickly. Um, there are also some some views of the um, of this space that I think um, might also be helpful. I'm for the moment because I think we might just be talking about some of the kind of framing conditions of the project. I might just um, leave up um, a, a kind of install shot, and that'll kind of bring us bring us into the conversation. Um, so let me just that uh, screen. So um, Suzanne and Laura, I wonder um, if maybe you can sort of take the audience back to the the origins of this um, project and the um, the installation that we're looking at here. Um, this is the, the exhibition itself, but the project begins with a, a correspondence that um, you both sort of struck up um, during the, the early months of the, the pandemic. Um, so I'm wondering if you could sort of describe how that, um, how that collaboration or that correspondence unfolded, and then maybe also sort of walk us through what changed about, about the correspondence in the transition from the the exchange of um, of work by by mail or in, in the mailbox um, to to the the space to um, CPAC. Um, I don't I don't know which one of you would want to go first, but um, be curious to hear you talk about that. Laura, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, both Suzanne and I agree that we don't actually really remember how we sort of came up with this idea and but we did <laughs> whatever its origins were and I think we began exchanging as early as April and um you know from my perspective it was a moment where everything I had been working on I was really like you know in addition to sort of having the pandemic experience that everyone else was having, I was really cut off. Like my, my work really depends on like working with people and having access to labs. And I, you know, sort of found myself in this place where, you know, I, I kind of just didn't really know what to do with myself. And so um, we started exchanging and really the only, um, you know, really the only thing we had sort of set up was that we would kind of respond to what the other person had sent us and that, you know, we would, we were going to sort of, the scale of it would be mailable. And so, um, Do you happen to recall who sent, who went first, like who, well, who sent the I first know, message? I'm pretty sure I don't remember who sent the first one, but I do remember the first one I got from Suzanne, which is that little um, blue piece. I, I think I put it very early in the PowerPoint. It says a, a, a piece of sky to fold into mm -hmm. your pocket. And I'm pretty sure the first thing that I sent Suzanne and maybe Suzanne would remember because yeah. I've also really thought of Suzanne as the archivist of the work I made. because <laughs> I, I, I told her that I would sort of almost immediately forget like what I'd center like it was kind of so this is this is the first thing Suzanne sent me but I think the first thing I sent Suzanne was this photograph which I had not made during the pandemic but was something you know I looped back to which was a photograph I made of um, Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Tuckless's, um grave at Père Lachaise and that, I think that was the first thing I said yes to yes that was <clears throat> yeah and so I was I was making things that in some ways I was kind of like going back to my archive and looking at images, which I had sort of not really 
um, reckoned with in some ways. And then I was also kind of making other things that weren't, you know, kind of strictly the things I had been making like in, in the, you know, last few years. So, um, Suzanne? Yes, no, I like this, that idea of the looping call and response that's, <laughs> that's in the uh, publicity for this show. And I think that's what it was. And I, yeah, and I don't remember how exactly we decided to do this, but I'm certainly glad that we, that we did and continue to um, exchange ideas and work. But I, um, yes, the Gertrude Stein Toklas grave was the first thing I received and it was a photograph. And that's the other thing our practices are very different. I hadn't done any photography, um, any serious photography, certainly, um, and it's not a part of my practice, but this idea of the correspondence, yeah, you know, sort of this epistolary exchange, not like the 18th century novel, but something that we had to put in the mail and that had certain constraints on it was very appealing. I mean, theoretically, we could go and drop things off on each other's doorsteps, you know, and not, um, you know, follow protocol for the pandemic. But the idea of the constraint of something that would fit in the envelope was very appealing. And I know Laura went even further and, and went to the post office, but I, what I liked about her work was that um, both the envelope and the, and the piece itself are one and the same because she would, she'll tell you more about it probably, but you know, it could be folded, hers too could be folded. Um, a photo or cyanotype could be folded and then put um, addressed and put in the mail. And mine had to be small. And uh, you know, they're this kind of miniaturization of language and literally what I put in there could be folded and put in your pocket. I like that. Um, I like the idea of the miniature in that in that sense, and something that's handheld or that could fit in the pocket. And a lot of what I do in my often in my especially when it's ephemeral materials in my installations is I sweep it up at the end, or I keep only that what fits in the pocket. And the pocket being you know something close close to the body as as well. But yeah, these envelopes. So we we Laura. Laura's work, the envelope, the container, and the um, artwork were one and the same. And, and I found myself making my own envelopes um, and sometimes like Russian dolls envelopes within envelopes. Or I think the one that said letters inside actually had it was a silly pun because it had letters in it. And yeah, this is one, Laura, you probably wanted to, you might want to tell more about this idea of the envelope and the um, piece being one and the same. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one other thing about the about mail art. I mean, I do think about mail art and like a Ray Johnson or a, a Eugenio Dittborn. Um, you know, for Dittborn, it's, it was a political thing, you know, not being able to travel. We have other travel concerns, mm. but, but this idea that it, you know, could be kind of, um, um, you know, a way of getting a, around a constraint or a, a way of another form of travel. And that's why I think boats and planes are also kind of part of this. And then with the uh, the Ray Johnson, it's more like the outsider getting in on, you know, an inside track. So so there are aspects of just mail art that I think are, are appealing as well. I, I mean, it just strikes me that there's also, I mean, there's a sort of travel implied in sharing a photograph, uh, you know, from Paris, um, yeah. which is a, a kind of shared mm -hmm. geography for the both of you, but not, I, I don't think one that you would ever have shared at the same time have you ever overlapped in, in Paris? Almost. <laughs> but well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like two weeks difference when we were both on part of um, Joey Tang's and um, Thomas Fougereau's uh, photogram project, but we did not overlap. Would it, Laura, um, would it make sense to talk about that photogram project a little bit? Because I know it sort of is in the background of some of the, yeah, the work sure. you were making in the show. Um, so, uh, Joey and Thomas organized this project called Dust Plates of the Present. And um, Thomas has a dark room um, and he lives in, I, the, the name of the district is escaping me, but it's just sort of outside of Paris. And they would invite friends, artists, musicians to come in and make photograms. And they sort of built this archive of images and I think everyone would produce eight photograms and sort of donate them to the archive and 
um, I, I'm pretty sure Joey's in the audience, but um, if he <laughs> wanted to sort of put some numbers in the chat, but um, so both Suzanne and I participated in that project and, that, and the project is on view now at the Pompidou. Um, and so, yeah, just to sort of circle back, like, you know, and I think the other, yeah, the other, just the really germane thing to know about, about um, the project is that it, like, it wasn't just photographers, it was people who came in who had like no experience in a dark room. So there's this really kind of, you know, just sort of brilliant spectrum of how people came into, you know, making these images. So, um, so when I was there, it was for me, like I, I ended up, sort of exploring some ideas that had, were sort of carrying over from another project. And, um, and this sort of really explicitly, I mean, this is, this is a photogram, but it's also a cyanotype, which is a very early um, photographic process. And you sort of expose the emulsions to the sun and it's very slow. And this particular image is a little bit of a reprisal of something that I had done for dust it's very hard to tell, but they're pins. And so they're actually holes in the print. And that's a kind of ongoing interest of mine, like how, how to kind of like literally sort of tear the paper um, or sort of think about a hole being a kind of disruption in the, in the, in the verisimilitude of a photograph. Um, and so, yeah, so I was just, you know, again, I didn't have access to a dark room. I started making cyanotypes essentially in my basement and exposing them in my backyard and then washing them in my kitchen sink. And, you know, so it was great because I was able to sort of, you know, kind of weave in these sort of past lines of work and have them kind of reinvigorated sort of in dialogue with, with Suzanne. So this is a pretty small piece of them eight and a half by 11 and I just folded it in half and taped it together. This sort of leaping ahead a bit and what I think we should kind of come back to the, the just the, the genesis of the, of the exhibition out of the, the collaboration or the, the epistolary correspondence. But I just wanna note that some of the first works that visitors see upon entering the space are, um, are photograms and, and um, you know, it, the, this, um, I, let me, I can actually make this much larger um, just so the audience can get a sense of the detail. Um, it's, a, it's a work with um, a series of um, words on the left, whole wound, prick, pierce, gash. And then at right, um, so that's, that's the work at left. And then at right, um, a work, uh, a, a pair of works um, the depicting hands or depicting might not be the right word here. Um, so to, again, this is, this is um, a bit of just a bit of mise-en-scene as you're, as you're entering the show. Um, I, I wonder, um, we, we maybe can come back to these works and, and also to the, to the word list, which I think is, um, is crucial in many ways for the show. Um, maybe we could go back for a minute to the, the kind of, again, the, the genesis of the Correspondence. I mean, at what point um, was it clear that an exhibition was going to come out of this? And then I'm curious, like, sort of how how the terms of your collaboration changed once it became clear that you would be working sort of in the space, but not necessarily together at the same time. Um, maybe you could walk us through that that process. Well, actually, thanks to, to Laura and her relationship with Alyssa that um, we had this venue. I mean, I um, hadn't really thought, um, I mean, we were wondering what would, what would happen, whether there'd be stages past the mail correspondence and, and you know, what form that might take. And, um, you know, we're still open to other iterations. Um, but, but, you know, my thanks to both Laura and Alyssa for pro um, providing this um, physical space. And it's an incredible space. I mean, as Alyssa said, and you can see in the you can see in the video, um, it was a former fire engine manufacturing um, uh, operation and the whole building is really incredible. So then this very space is, and it, um, so in essence, the space became our third collaborator. I mean, I really think about it that, that way. Um, and the, the ideas and the themes and the language that we had already um, developed through the, 
uh, looping mail call and response um, were better at or you know better articulated or just articulated differently in this space and the very holes and pricks that um, Laura was talking about in the photograms um, are manifest in the uh, in the floor in particular you know I mean it, it's just there um, staples and holes and cracks and um, openings so it's it's like the physical physical manifestation of all the ideas we were we have been talking about it uh, talking about so it's it's just there so my first actions were to kind of um, plug up some of the holes I mean with with shiny foil so it's little constellations formed and that mm. um, asterisk you know that plate is part of the um, floor then there are other ones that kind of look like felt or sandpaper um, so I added felt and real actual felt and um, foil and in, uh, it just seemed like something emanating and then you know then it echoes in Laura's photogram of the, the arms emanating out from a central hub so there are these motifs that reoccur that you know that are already in our art and then we kind of pick up on it and maybe bring it into the space and then respond anew yeah and I'll, I'll i'll add that we um you know after several months of corresponding we we finally had a studio visit in september and all right i mean one of the things we did like you know we kind of like laid everything out and you know, we sort of saw that there was like a, a vocabulary at that point that we were working with and we kind of pooled all of this language. And so I think like at that point there was a different, um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know if it was more like our sort of subconscious was becoming conscious or something, but it, it did all of a sudden, like it, it felt like we had sort of developed a certain kind of language. And I, um, I, re I realize it's a little bit of a pause, but um, I I want to thank Alyssa for her introduction because I think in some ways she articulated a lot um, of kind of like I don't know like how we came into the space and sort of like how we were had sort of primed ourselves and and in some ways the space itself was um, yeah it was kind of it was sort of it was ready to be healed, right? And I guess, you know, we're, we're all ready to be healed at this point. Um, the other thing I was really struck by, um, I'm sorry if I'm like going off on a tangent here, but like in watching the video, I was like, oh, right. It's a space that people work in. <laughs> like, cause Suzanne and, and I are only ever there by ourselves. And, you know, there's certainly, you can see that it's a place where, where things are produced, but, um, you know, it's more like we're sort of, we're just sort of working on our own. So it feels very different. It was kind of, I don't know, it was sort of wonderful for me to see people in this space, but. Um, I mean, for, for folks who haven't been to the center yet, um, I mean, one thing to know about it is that like, it's really a space marked by labor um, and mm -hmm. by its, its industrial past. Um, you know, the, the floors, um, I mean, it, actually the, the first day I visited, I think the floors outside of the gallery were, someone was there with a huge machine just sort of desperately trying to sand them down to kind of smooth them over. But I mean, right. it's part of the vocabulary of the space, you know, not that sort of lobby area that, um, that they were, you know, pushing and pushing over with the machine, but like the, the center itself, part of its sort of psychogeography is that the floors are sort of disintegrating, but you, you, they're totally solid at the same time. It's these, this sort of, um, uh, you know, um, combination of like real kind of like, um, you know, industrial era, um, you know, uh, solidity and, and just ephemerality at the same time. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, I guess the other, just about the building, because I think there's so much to think about, you know, on the score of like the building as a third collaborator or a third partner. Um, it's just like thinking about, you um, the, the particulars of the building I think are interesting, but I maybe wanted to start by just thinking with you about like the general of like what it was like to shift from working at, you know, in the confines of your domestic space during a pandemic to like then moving into this space that, um, you know, is sort of um, uncannily available for public use. And yet at the same time, there's still, you know, we're still, in the midst of the pandemic, um, even even now, I think like people are still sort of leery about going to 
to see art in spaces. So I, I just wondered, yeah, how, how the kind of being in, in sort of semi-public space or something again, and in an, in an office type space um, um, during the pandemic kind of changed the, your, your thinking about the work or just sort of in, inflected what you ended up doing there. I think you know, um, being able to collaborate has been a generative experience, um, I think, for both of us. And then being in that space is also generative. I mean, it's really the catalyst for, for the progression of the work. And, and it's, it's wonderful to, I mean, it's one of the few places I you know, have to admit that I go to, I mean, outside of my home. So it's really not, not a refuge, but it's just wonderful to be in another space and, and to have that physical space to respond to. And that's basically, I mean, you see, like the nails here are are there. I mean, it's not something I added. I mean, so it just happens to be there are just so many affinities with the space and the and as Laura I think said with the vocabulary we've been building. I I also want to say that we soon kind of violated the, our own rules. We thought we would be there, you know, two weeks for one, two weeks for the other, but it didn't make sense. And so we would sometimes be there at the same time, sometimes. Um, alone individually um, responding and it, it just seems to work better that way we don't need those two week intervals but being, well, else, it's yeah. such a huge space like I think yeah. we had like in some ways I think we were I was I had it in my mind it, it, it sort of had the rhythm of your of your exhibition at the dealer where there was like mm -hmm. this kind of mix up every every few weeks but it's such a huge space <laughs> that it does it almost doesn't really make sense in a way. Like, and I think we were both having, you know, in addition to sort of our works talking to one another, we were like, you know, all of a sudden had this, um, you know, third collaborator in, in the in the space. So it almost it, it it almost didn't make sense. And so we were kind of continuing sort of at our own pace, um, you know, to 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 kind of accumulate works. Um, did, did the introduction of that third collaborator, I mean, the, the, the shift to the space, did that sort of throw into relief different ways that you each work? Because I know you both have really different studio practices and that sort of shows up in the space in various ways. Yeah, for sure. And I think I, I like what Laura says about I was having different metabolisms, you know, in terms of the way in which we work. And, I, you know, I, I'm, Laura will speak for herself, I'm more improvisatory and um, do things ad hoc and respond to the physical space. But early on, we figured out that it would, you know, Laura would have the wall, the walls, because she has the photographs, the wall works. And we also have, we, you know, each have work in the vitrine, you know, to, to house the um, male part of the correspondence. Um, so mostly Laura's things are on, work is on the walls and mostly mine are on the floors or on the columns. So they, Mm -hmm. Disease or the you know more not exactly liminal spaces but like the spaces in between or where I would small scale interact and then Laura has this that great large photo at one end that um, and then this series here and then other photos so so we kind of n naturally fell into those kinds of spaces yeah there and you have the windows too you really yeah, right. uh, kind of animated animated the windows as well. Um, yeah, and then I think the other thing too is, I think when we kind of came into it, you know, one of the first days we were sort of putting things that we had sent to each other on the walls. Yeah. And for the most part, like it didn't make sense. Like, and I, you know, I think kind of what we, we came up with this idea of having the vitrine that was, you know, you know, where we had a kind of archive of what we had exchanged. And then, you know, like those were sort of, that was kind of like the pool that we were kind of working from when we went into the space. And so it, it ended up like, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, if the vitrine is sort of like the spring, you know, then we, you know, there are these ways that we began to sort of um, work I mean, actually like at a lot of different scales, if you think about it, you know, like we've got, it's sort of, there's like a sort of span of, you know, anything from like miniature to sort of more monumental um, works in the space. And, you know, and what's kind of remarkable is that it still feels very quiet to me in that space. Like, I, I feel like the exhibition feels very 
quiet in spite of, you know, some of the, you know, some of the language that we're using that talks about, um, you know, distress and anxiety and, and, and pain <laughs> and wounds and, um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so this is a, this image is of like a detail um, of the vitrine and um, yeah. Yeah, and also I think um, maybe it's by nature of the largeness of the space, but it's quite spare, almost Spartan and severe, but there's a lot in there. I mean, literally a lot of racism yeah. and a number of, you know, more major scale pieces, but it still seems spare and quiet as, you know, Laura indicated. I wondered, um, thinking again about language and um, its kind of prominence in the show, prominence is not quite the right word because I think as you're saying, the show is, um, you know, it, it has a kind of quietness and also a, like there's a dimension to the show where you, um, you know, you have to go looking for the work. Like it doesn't, it doesn't always kind of call out to you um, directly or, or seize your attention. I mean, then some things that do seize your attention, um, you know, are also sort of have their own questions and conundrums that, that um, present themselves. Like, for example, just the, thinking about the, the photograms in the entryway, um, you know, even just thinking about how they're made is part of what the work requires you to do um, at the same time as it is sort of like presenting you with a series of, um, you know, nouns that are also verbs in certain ways. Um, I, I, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, just the the kind of um, the presence of language in, in the exhibition, the installation. Um, I, this is something that I don't think the three of us have talked about before, but I wondered if, if you might um, each sort of think about um, the, the kind of question of gender in the, the show. Like the, there are moments when I feel like the show kind of asks questions about the gender of the space um, or is interested in the space's sort of status as a body. Um, and I just wondered if that, if there were moments when your, you know, your dialogue sort of touched um, on that, that body, like what, what kind of a body is this space and what do these, um, what do these gestures, what do these words sort of um, mean in, in this body? Um, there, there are moments in the show where, for example, like the, the kind of um, limit or perineum between the inside and the outside is marked. Um, there are other moments that feel like sort of the cavities of the body are being probed um, or like the physiognomy of the building is sort of, um, is, is marked without necessarily making it meaningful. Um, so I just, I wonder if this kind of line of questioning resonates with you. Um, again, thinking about the the body of the building or the of the of the room in a certain way. Hmm. Suzanne, do you want to? <laughs> well, I I I, <laughs> I mean, you had that uh, piece with the little soap boat. So I mean, I don't think this is this isn't the you know. Uh, That's the, this here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are a couple of soap boats, but I mean. I think touch is the main thing. And we're talking, I mean, even that's not, well, even with the soap. I mean, the soap, obviously, the soap, it's for the pandemic, but it's also something that floats. There's a lot of water imagery. I think these things all lead one to the other. So I hadn't thought about it quite in the terms you set up, Danny, but it's really, really interesting. And um, there's definitely this inside, outside, there are the words like ash and wound and prick and, you know, all sorts of <laughs> bodily references. Um, yeah, I hadn't. I but I when I think about it, I also think of gesture, and that's very important to Laura's work. And I and I think I kind of picked up on it a little bit. And um, um, and uh, yeah, and touch, and you know, which is something that people miss during this time. But I, in terms of the space itself, I mean, I think the structure of it has certainly influenced both of us. And I see, I mean, that there's that one of the images where the um. um it's almost like the, I don't know, the inside of a whale or the inside of a ship. I mean, there, there's, there's that upper level we still haven't done. I mean, it's part of it, you see it, but we haven't um, directly addressed it in the sense that we haven't put any work up there, but it really informs the whole space and the viewing process. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a rib, rib cage. But I, 
I don't, I don't think I have a better answer than that. I, do, I can talk about structure and language and also the fact that um, it wasn't until the end that, we, that Laura and I realized that we're, even though we had observed it daily, that the type, the physical type font, um, ha, you know, plays a large role. And yes, and, there, and, and luckily Laura included that in the, um, in the images. Um, that were surrounded by the structure of language, you know, and um, you know, it's a center for printed arts, but literally the Vandercook Press and the and the fonts there, um, and you know, the relationships with the language on the floor. I'm I'm um, digressing here, so I you know, we'll get back to the body, um, and um, we can talk about this this type of structure later. But Laura, did you have anything to add about the building and the body and, and gendering the space? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have, have a, I think I would need to sort of think a little bit more about it in relationship to the building. Um, I mean, I definitely, with the photogram of whole prick wound um, gash, you know, I was definitely thinking about the way that that language also, you know, slips into like derogatory sexist language, you know, just, you know, in reference to women's bodies, um, you know, with the exception of prick. Um, and, you know, so there's like lots of different kind of levels of reference going on in there. And, you know, like, you know, not only with like the wounding of a body, but also the way that Bart talks about the experience of, you know, the punctum um, in the photograph, um, you know, there are ways in which I think my interest in like gendered language and, you know, thinking about relationships between women and female friendship and female desire, like is kind of seeping in to this work. And I would say that the sort of large photograph um, that it, and it might be kind of hard for some people to see, but it's essentially two women who are sort of holding these, um, you know, what look like, you know, what I what I hope to look like holes. Like I, I went, I really did literally think of them as like holes and that, you know, it was like trying to kind of bring that kind of language into an image and, you know, but there were also these other things at play. Like I was thinking about like, okay, this is where the representation sort of like, you know, it, it's like the, um, you know, road runner <laughs> where it's like, it's like he puts down the hole yeah. and then like <laughs> Wiley Coyote falls in, um, you know, like I was kind of thinking about that and, but also like thinking about them signaling to each other. And, you know, like it's like for me, like I was also thinking about Suzanne's work, um, which is about, um, you know, the sort of naval flags and signaling and, you know, and so like all of this stuff was sort of in there and the fact that it's sort of like two women signaling to each other, the size of those holes is exactly the same, which doesn't really make sense in terms of thinking about, you know, um, perspective and scale and, you know, kind of like trying to sort of disturb the image in some ways. So, but, you know, like I, I mean, not to be too literal, but like I did like feel like on a certain level that having this collaboration with Suzanne over the months was like a kind of psychic signaling to each other. And, it, you know, it was also a way in which I was, you know, we were, you know, growing, growing our friendship. And so, but I don't know if I have like a kind of good response about the space, you know, like in the sense of sort of how yeah, thinking about how like kind of gender sort of seeps seeps into the space. But I, I, guess, I am I'm intrigued by this question. I wonder if it's, I mean, having put the question that way, I wonder if it might make more sense actually to think about it in, in sort of reverse terms where the space sort of, you know, undoes the gender of language. I mean, it's it, it's a space in which words are actually sort of broken apart. I mean, that's, that's what the typeset mm -hmm. is about mm -hmm. on some level. Um, I, I don't know, or also just that it happens to be a space that contains um, and kind of both records and is the condition of possibility of a dialogue between the two of you that is not 
not a written dialogue. I mean, is is a, a kind of dialogue um, outside of or kind of around the margins of language. Um, that seems like maybe just a different direction, <laughs> a different polarity of interpretation. But mm -hmm. Laura, I wanted yeah. to ask you about ha having. Um, I saw the show twice. I probably should have seen it more times, um, but at least I did see it twice. And um, the and I saw it just again last weekend. And there were two works that I hadn't seen before. Um, unless it's of course possible that I like completely spaced um, and, and did see them, but I'm reasonably certain photograph silence and then silence photograph. Yeah, those are new. This is new. I, did you want to talk about these at all? I'm just, they, they actually, I found them really affecting, but I, um, I didn't have a sense of like how you would think about them or talk about them. Um. Well, I, I just installed them last week and I'll, I'll be perfectly, <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest. I, I don't know if I have um, a lot of sort of assured language for discussing them. And I, I had just, before I had installed these, I installed a sound piece, which is kind of located very close to these images, which is, um, there, it's, it's just the sound of a, um, of a slide projector sort of advancing like, um, yeah. and it's, it's on a loop. And so part of it was, you know, I kept, you know, like I was, I was trying to think a little bit about the question of like, what would, you know, what, what would a photograph of this moment in our lives look like? And I had been making, I had been shooting slide film. I mean, I still am with the idea of making a, like a kind of slide presentation but like for me nothing was really congealing and in some ways I was I liked this idea of like the sound which was like a kind of mechanical sound which in some ways I felt you know I was kind of imagining in dialogue with um you know the the ghosts the ghosts of industry of manufacturing that are in that building right and but also just sort of thinking about you know like yeah, like that these, that like what, what, like what does an image of this time look like in our lives, right? And so I, I guess I sort of see the slide piece, you know, and these two photograms kind of looping, looping together and sort of thinking about um, just, yeah, how to bring, how to bring sound into the vacuum of, of imagery. I, I wonder if that might link us in some way. I, it may not, but um, but just with this um, <laughs> the this uh, also I think a recent edition, um, and this is Suzanne's work, one of her sentence diagrams. Um, Suzanne, did you want to? Would you would you mind talking quickly about this one? It I, when we oh, talked sorry. about it the other day, I remember thinking this seemed like a, a very different sort of Suzanne photo uh, sentence yeah, diagram than the ones that I am accustomed to. <laughs> I didn't probe you on that. I don't, you know, have to hear <laughs> eventually what exactly did you mean by that? But, <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, this is referential, self-referential because I, um, just going back to the photograms, I was one of those non-photographers and, um, you know, uh, who was in the uh, dark room uh, outside of Paris. Um, but what emerged from that was using light. And so I had been making, I still make during this pandemic, works that are predicated on the sun shining and, uh, and going through either holes I make in metal and some of those plates I've used in some of the cutout letters from the sentence diagrams I've used with the sun hitting it and then the light and shadow and there I think there's one slide that that shows that before the piece is on the floor so I um, am actually talking about that the sun shone brightly and we made pictures to welcome you so it, it also kind of refers to the pandemic mm -hmm. practice that's that's one of it so before the how does one know a sound um how can one know a sound is nailed to the floor um yeah it's kind of it's casting shadow um and so a lot of these were used um either with the sun uh which is really beautiful in there when it comes to the windows on one side it's, it's really breathtaking um or when it you know before i brought the metal if i made the metal at home and not on site you know i i would 
do these sun pictures there. So it's, there's also this idea of the gift. I mean, welcoming maybe, <laughs> or maybe it's, it's a little cheerier than I is my want, but um, the idea of the gift I think has been present with throughout our correspondence and um, literally with the um, male correspondence. And I think Laura is the one who, who said initially that, yeah, it, you know, it's just kind of the act of opening up the envelopes, um, you know, and, um, you know, the expectation and then the um, kind of gratification that comes with finding it, it is kind of like a, a gift exchange. And, and, uh, and then the collection, I mean, these things also enter into it, archive, gift collection. But this one is a more recent one. And I was thinking about um, the sun pictures and, you know, um, talking maybe beyond Laura and myself to whoever comes to that space. And, mm -hmm. you know. Maybe this would be a good place to open up for questions if they are um, latent in the audience. Um, if you do have a question, you really have, you know, um, there's just an embarrassment of riches here in terms of ways to, ways to ask it. Um, I, I'm looking at the chat, I'm looking at the, the questions, the Q and A box. Um, I think it may also be possible for um, listeners to turn their audio on if they can figure that out. I guess that's also a way to, we can, to join We the can hear your spirit voices. <laughs> I think if people want to raise their hand, I might be able to give them, give them their voice. Thank you to Michael for um, coming and seeing the show. And yes. I'm glad it felt like a good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> good question, Amira. So Suzanne, Amira asks if you could talk about your, I guess actually this is probably a question for both of you. Uh, if you could yes. talk about navigating the postal system. Um, I, I must admit, and you know, it, it was very different. So I only used the small envelopes and walk it over to our local mailbox. I rarely went to the actual post office. So, so it wasn't stressful. I avoided the stress. Let me hear. Yeah, I don't know. Laura, Laura went to the post office. <laughs> I, I did go to the post office and it was incredibly stressful <laughs> but, um, but I, I also was um, just yeah I mean I, I felt I just I felt like I, I needed to do it you know it was like that I would it was the risk worth taking um, and yeah I, I, I don't know I don't I don't think I have a, a, anything beyond beyond saying that um, but there's a bunch of questions here now. Yeah, there's a, I, I'm just kind of running up to the, to the top of the, the list here. Joey asks about um, the scale shift between the miniature and the, the um, you know, the, the non-miniature, the, the, the scale of this massive space. Um, and, um, you know, notes that there is something about the relationship between the individual and the and the, you know, the collective or the absent collective, even during the pandemic, um, he, he wants to know, um, yeah, what, what this experience might do to each of your practices moving forward um, beyond this, beyond this show, but also maybe beyond the pandemic, if we can ever dig out of it. Um, I, one thing I would, would say about the pandemic and the, um, individual art practice. And I heard something really interesting by um, Anne Bogart, the um, theater director, and, and she was in turn quoting the Danish director who said, this is not a time for subjectivities. And I really believe that even though, you know, it's been introspective for, for a lot of us, but I think it is a time where we have to go beyond whether it's political action or community action of some kind. So I think even the collaborative on a mini scale <laughs> takes us out of ourselves. Um, you know, in terms of the physical shift from the miniature to um, and something more expansive. I mean, I'm one, you know, I always talk about, you know, the book going beyond this, 
beyond its cover, you know, covers. In other words, something small can still have the exp expansive power. So it's not always so much just the physical scale. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I would still aim to have something no matter what the physical size um, resonate, you know, be beyond the, the physical constraints. Um, I don't know, but it is, it does open up different ways to work. I mean, uh, um, Laura, and of course, Joey is, I'm indebted all, forever indebted to Joey for allowing me to um, work the way I did at Beeler Gallery and having one iteration after the other. So it wasn't fixed, it was expansive. And that's something I still carry with me and um, would hope to do elsewhere. Um, the other, only other thing, and this is just more personal is that I, I do hope to do something with those sun pictures and um, and should, you know, it's something ephemeral, should it be actually predicated on the sun or an electric light bulb or um, the photos of the, that, you know, capture the experience. So there are things that have emerged during this whole pandemic, both in the collaboration and in, in my individual work that um, are different and I, and our new forms. And I think that's one of the only good outcomes of, <laughs> of these constraints, um, the emergence of new forms. And I'm, you know, excited to think what might happen afterwards, but I don't really, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure either. I mean, in some ways, I, I think there have been things long brewing in my studio that in, have, um, kind of found an expression in this experience that I wonder if they would have happened anyway. Um, and I, you know, I think in terms of scale, like I, I've always like sort of shuttled between the miniature and the monumental. I mean, as, as sort of as monumental as photographs get, which is still fairly, um, you know, sort of not that monumental. Um, so, but I think I've been kind of going towards a kind of model of working, which, you know, has been informed by sustainability, which has been informed by, you know, I like working collaboratively. And I think that has a lot to do with a kind of, you know, a kind of desire to be in the world in some ways. And I, um, yeah, and I mean, it's funny, Joe, that you're asking this question because I feel like just um, working with you and becoming your friend has been, has been such a kind of, I've just shifted so many ways in which I think about like how you even make an exhibition and just ways kind of contemplative speeds of working, which, um, you know, it's sort of, it's upended a lot of ways in which, or it's made me question certain assumptions I've had about like how I should be making work and, and putting it out in the world. So I guess, um, you know, I think for me, I'm, I'm more interested in sort of embracing like the contingent aspects of, of work of making photographs rather than you know, kind of thinking about how I've been presenting them professionally, like, you know, for my, for my entire career, working collaboratively, thinking kind of, I don't know, like a certain kind of unfolding of working rather than, you know, the sort of like discrete, like the sort of discrete projects. Um, and, you know, and again, like working with Suzanne who has um, <laughs> like a, a very different metabolism, like I sort of, I like, I like being, I like having her metabolism sort of next to mine. And I, I guess I sort of feel, yeah, I don't know if I'm really answering this question, but um, we are, we are going to try and make like a, some kind of publication to sort of around the collaboration. And I might, that might be an opportunity for me to do some more writing about it as well. There's a question in the chat about the idea of transmission via mail art, just sort of thinking about the, the kind of paranoia about the mail and about who might have touched your mail and all of that during the, the early days of the pandemic, but also the ways that mail has been thought to be weaponized or, or dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if um, you might want to speak to that. It's funny, I thought about that a lot early on because, you know, 
being, you know, a New Yorker and 9-11 and like, I mean, I guess it's, it's not specific to being a New Yorker, but, you know, like the ways, you know, the sort of anthrax scares and, you know, and even early on in the, in the pandemic, you know, people were, you know, and maybe people still do, I don't, I don't, you know, like not opening mail for three days, like kind of waiting for the, you know, the COVID, COVID germs to go away. Um, and I, I'm trying to find this work in the, do you know what I'm looking for here? It's the, okay. the six foot um, device. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh yes, yes. Yeah, that, that, was early on. That, that was very <laughs> early on. It was a myth. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's crushed. I mean, <laughs> deliberately. I mean, there it is. Right. There it is. There That's it is. This. Right, right, right. That was an early, early piece. Right when the when we were first aware of that collapsed yeah. six ring model of body hoop cage for social distancing, and that's that's this. And it, yeah, you know, I, yeah, that was made early on when you know paranoia was more ex ex extreme. But, um, I like the juxtaposition here. That's something that came af obviously afterwards because um, the the river Sen, you know, the uh, you know, and the and the rings there don't really have anything to do with each other. But but um, we found, and I think Laura did this one. I mean, we found really interesting, um, you know, the where touch happens. I mean, one touches the other. I mean, the, mm. the um, you know, the layering or the superimposition of one to the other, new new relationships. So that's another outcome. Just one very quick <laughs> anecdote about. about male and anthrax, and when I had a show years ago, I guess it was right after 9-11, um, um, I used a lot of powders, um, um, uh, colored pigments and powder, talcum powder, baby powder, and it was right after the male, the uh, talcum scare, and they shut down the show because I had what was baby powder on the floor. It was temporarily shut down um, until like I could prove that it was just baby powder. Um, but the, you know, the talk about heightened, Paranoia. Not that these problems don't exist, of, of course, but um, that was one um, early experience of problems with with the male mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's, its effect on art. Yeah. I mean, I can sort of imagine wanting actually to to, especially in those days, to sort of find some way of reclaiming. You know, it's not just reclaiming the male and sort of making it exciting to put something into the male and get it, um, get something from the mailbox, but you know, also just sort of reclaiming social, you know, social contact, like even if it's mediated at a distance, like someone has touched this thing and I'm, I'm cool with that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> like that's not, yeah. that's not bad. Well, those cyanotypes that I made that I folded up, like they were, they were sort of, I was thinking about handling and thinking about, you know, the sort of visualizations, you know, in the New York Times about like spread and you know, that's that sort of that that kind of information was filtering was filtering into the to the images too, just with regards to the idea of transmission. I just want to relay quickly um, a, a very um, thoughtful comment in the chat. This is from Gina Osterlo. Um, I'm struck. I'll just read it. I'm struck by how much discovery, presence, and surprises are composed or created throughout the print center. The encourage for the the encounter for the viewer uh, uh, very much feels like experiencing a gift. I'm also struck by the quality of light or the creation of light by each work. Thank you, Gina. Gina. <laughs> um, I wonder if we might consider leaving things off. There, uh, there are actually now that I say that I realize there's a whole world of questions in the Q and A. So I, I completely <laughs> retract. Apologies. <laughs> Um, there are three questions in the Q and A. Um, I think time-wise, um, Suzanne, uh, Laura, maybe we'll take um, just one or two, um, uh, and potentially we can answer the rest um, textually uh, if that's if that's possible. Um, of the three questions, there's um, the the first is from Dory, who asks about um, this is for Suzanne, just the armature that her text is um, is placed on is, I, I think this might mean, you know, the, just the, the metal material that it's, it's cut out of, but I, I could be misreading. I, I took it to mean the, um, the structure of the sentence diagrams. I'm, um, or, yeah. or 
the plaques. I mean, it's all, most of it's either thin, thin aluminum or aluminum foil that you use in the, in the kitchen. Um, so I'm thinking for the plaques it was more like memorial, but the plates, it's more like memorial plaques, you know, so this idea of memory and that has our shared vocabulary, the archive of our shared vocabulary, and it, and it continues in puncture. The, the other armature of sorts is the structure of the sentence diagram. That's the device that I didn't even learn in school that kind of predates me, but it's a you know linguistic tool to uh, learn grammar and separate parts of speech. So I use that structure as an armature for the text. And then it also, because I don't really know how to do it, um, to, and I, to me, you can read it differently and it's a sort of found poetry as 